What happens when one of the world's leading physicists sits down with Joe Rogan to challenge centuries of belief? In this explosive conversation, Brian Cox doesn't just question the existence of God, he reshapes the entire debate. Science, consciousness, and cosmic origins collide in a way you've never heard before. The moment that shook the God versus universe debate. In one of the most captivating episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience, Professor Brian Cox stepped into a conversation that has spanned centuries, the clash between belief in God and the understanding of the universe through science. Rogan opened the floor with a familiar dichotomy, science versus spirituality, theology versus cosmology. But Cox didn't bite. He didn't dismiss religion or attack faith. Instead, he reframed the debate in a way that caught even Rogan off guard. We don't know all the answers, Cox admitted, almost casually, referring to the origins of the universe and the laws of nature. That statement alone, coming from a physicist known for his work with CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, carried weight. The real shock was not in a discovery, but in the tone of the conversation. Cox made it clear that science doesn't claim certainty on metaphysical questions. Rather, it offers a framework built on what we can observe, measure, and verify. This wasn't a takedown of God. It was a soft reset. It was about reshaping how we ask the questions. The atmosphere shifted from argument to inquiry, and that's what made it powerful. Rogan responded with surprise and curiosity, echoing a larger trend in public discourse where more people are becoming agnostic or at least open to the vast unknowns. Transitioning from the impact of that moment, we now ask, what does science actually know and where do its limits begin? What science actually knows and what it doesn't. Brian Cox emphasized something many people misunderstand. Science is not about opinions. It's about observation. That's a big deal. It means every claim must come from what we can physically detect or calculate. For example, scientists have measured that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. That's not a belief. It's not a guess. It's a number based on hard data, on light that has traveled for billions of years, on cosmic microwave background radiation, and on the expanding galaxies we can see with powerful telescopes. But there's a twist. Even with all this precision, science still doesn't know why the universe began the way it did. Cox pointed out that the early universe was highly ordered, and we don't yet understand the reason behind that. This leads to the concept of the arrow of time, why time moves forward and not backward. Time, as we experience it, is deeply tied to that initial order. These aren't random musings, they're real scientific puzzles. Yet Cox was clear, acknowledging these limits doesn't weaken science. It strengthens it. It shows a kind of intellectual humility. We don't know why the Big Bang happened, he said, but we're working on it. That's the difference between science and dogma. Science evolves as evidence changes. So, if science is humble in the face of the unknown, how does it handle the biggest unknown of all, whether the universe was created? Does the universe require a creator? Cox's perspective. Cox didn't dodge the big question. Does the universe need a creator? His answer was clear. Science can't yet answer that. And it may never be able to. Instead, he explained what science can do, described the natural laws that govern stars, planets, and galaxies. He walked Rogan through what we do know, how stars fuse elements, how carbon and oxygen are formed in stellar furnaces, and how these elements eventually lead to life. This is the how, not the why. But Cox offered something more intriguing. He suggested that the universe may not have had a beginning at all. Time itself could be an emergent property, something that only makes sense after the Big Bang. This echoes theories from physicists like Stephen Hawking, who famously proposed that asking what happened before the Big Bang might be like asking what's north of the North Pole. It's a question that might not even make sense. And still, Cox doesn't shut the door on theology. He just sets a boundary. If religious belief insists on denying observed facts, like the age of the Earth or the structure of the cosmos, then that belief is stepping outside the framework of reality. But if it stays within the framework of what we can see and measure, there's room for conversation. So then, if our understanding of the universe is shaped by observation, what role does that act of observing actually play? The role of observation in reality. Observation is not just a scientific tool, it's a foundational concept in physics. Brian Cox reminded Rogan that we know what we know because we've measured it. When we say the Earth is round, 
or that black holes exist, or that gravitational waves ripple through space. We're not guessing. We've measured these things with precise instruments. That's what separates science from speculation. Take stars, for example. We know how they form, burn, and die. We understand how they make carbon and oxygen, the very elements that make us. Cox explained that if you look further into space, you're looking back in time. And when you do, you see fewer heavy elements. Why? Because early stars hadn't made them yet. That's observation, not belief. It's not an opinion that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, Cox said. It's like having an opinion on the distance from LA to New York. You can't just make it up. Science doesn't say God doesn't exist. It just says there's no evidence for God in what we can observe. And that's a key difference. Science isn't theology. It doesn't preach. It measures. And this brings us to one of the most mind-bending ideas of all, how time itself might not be what we think it is. The philosophical twist, time and existence. Brian Cox introduced a concept that sounds like science fiction, but comes straight from modern physics. Time might be emergent, meaning it might not be a basic building block of the universe, but something that arises only under certain conditions, like how temperature is just the average motion of atoms. If there's only one atom, you can't say it's hot or cold. Same with time. Without a complex enough structure, there may be no way to define before or after. That's why asking what happened before the Big Bang might be a meaningless question. Cox used Stephen Hawking's famous analogy. Imagine walking north until you hit the North Pole. Now try to go further north. You can't. North ends there. Maybe time is like that. It starts with the Big Bang, and asking what came before is like asking what's beyond the edge of a circle. This challenges a lot of religious assumptions, because many belief systems are built on the idea of a timeline, a beginning, a creation. Cox isn't saying those views are wrong. He's saying they may not apply to the actual structure of reality, and that opens a whole new way of looking at existence itself. So, if time and creation might not mean what we think they mean, where does that leave religion? Not as explanation, but as experience. Religion as human experience versus cosmic explanation. When Brian Cox talks about religion, he doesn't roll his eyes, he listens. He acknowledges that for millions of people, religion gives comfort, a sense of belonging, and emotional meaning. But he also sets clear boundaries. Religion, he argues, wasn't designed to answer scientific questions. It can't tell you the mass of a neutron or how long ago the Big Bang happened, because that's not its domain. Those are questions for observation, data, and physics. Cox brought up William James, the American philosopher who, in 1902, published The Varieties of Religious Experience. That book had a deep impact on Cox, not because it convinced him of the existence of God, but because it helped him understand why people believe. Not all religious thought is rigid or hostile to science. There's nuance, there's history, there's culture, but problems arise when theology tries to override measured reality. If a belief system says Earth is 6,000 years old, or denies evolution, it leaves the realm of personal meaning and enters misinformation. Cox emphasizes that faith and facts can coexist, but only if theology respects the boundaries of what we've measured and confirmed. As he put it, religion has a place, just not as a substitute for science. This naturally leads to a bigger question. If humans are not central in the cosmos, what does that mean for our value? The Copernican reality, we are not central. Cox doesn't sugarcoat it. We are not the center of anything, not of the universe, not of the Milky Way, not even of our solar system. In the grand scale of things, Earth is a tiny rock orbiting an average star in one of two trillion galaxies. But instead of feeling small, Cox sees something empowering in that. He describes humanity as a rare arrangement of atoms, a biological system capable of thinking about its own existence. And that's extraordinary. Our value doesn't come from being chosen or central. It comes from being aware. Meaning exists here, he said, because it means something to us. Cox quoted Richard Feynman, who once asked, what is the meaning of it all? and suggested that even if meaning isn't built into the universe, it arises within us. Meaning is local, emergent, and fragile, and that makes it more urgent, not less. This shift in focus from being chosen to being responsible leads directly into the next question. If we are the only intelligent life in the galaxy, what does that mean? 
intelligent life, and cosmic context. Joe Rogan raised a powerful question. Are we alone? Brian Cox didn't give a simple yes or no. Instead, he laid out the facts and uncertainties. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old, and there are billions of potentially habitable planets. So, why haven't we found anyone? That's the Fermi Paradox, the mystery of silence in a universe that should be teeming with life. Cox speculated that intelligent civilizations might be rare, short-lived, or simply uninterested in contacting us. He compared humanity to uncontacted tribes, like those on North Sentinel Island. Maybe advanced civilizations see us the same way. Primitive, not ready, best left alone. There's another possibility, maybe they're everywhere, but we just can't detect them. Their technology could be invisible to us, nanoscale, energy efficient, beyond anything we can currently imagine. But for Cox, the question of alien life isn't just scientific, it's ethical. If we are alone, or if we're one of the first, then we have a duty to preserve life, thought, and meaning. That's not arrogance, it's responsibility. And that brings us to the final question. Did Cox settle the debate between God and the universe? Consciousness, meaning, and responsibility. At this point in the conversation, Brian Cox pulls the focus away from distant galaxies and collapsing stars and turns it back toward us. Consciousness, he explains, is not something evenly spread across the universe. As far as we know, it is rare, fragile, and temporary. Most of the cosmos is silent, dark matter, empty space, radiation, and lifeless worlds. Against that backdrop, human awareness is an anomaly, a brief moment where atoms arrange themselves in such a precise way that they could ask questions, feel wonder, and reflect on their own existence. From that realization comes a powerful conclusion. Meaning is not written into the fabric of the universe. It doesn't exist in galaxies or laws of physics. Meaning exists here, inside conscious minds. You are responsible for it, Cox told Joe Rogan. You are that meaning. In other words, meaning is not something we discover. It's something we create. And because life is finite, because each human existence lasts only decades, not billions of years, that meaning becomes incredibly valuable. Cox is careful not to overclaim. Science, he says, does not yet explain consciousness. It doesn't know why subjective experience exists, where it truly comes from, or whether it survives beyond death. Those remain open questions. But what science can say is this. Consciousness changes everything. It allows us to imagine futures, make moral choices, and act with intention. It gives us the power to shape reality, not through cosmic forces, but through everyday decisions, ethics, and responsibility. This perspective doesn't strip life of the sacred. It transforms it. The sacred is no longer something distant or supernatural. It's immediate. It exists in awareness, in relationships, in curiosity, in the fragile fact that we are here at all. In Cox's view, that makes existence more meaningful, not less. Because if meaning is not guaranteed by the universe, then it is up to us to protect it, grow it, and live up to it. And in that realization, the conversation reaches one of its most profound turning points. Not about God or physics, but about what it truly means to be human. Final synthesis. Did Cox end the debate? No. Brian Cox didn't end the debate between God and the universe, but he did something far more profound. He redefined the conversation. Rather than dismiss belief or claim victory for science, he calmly laid out the limits of what science can and cannot say. We haven't found evidence, Paul. Be my best evidence, he said, but we're open to it. It's not a closing of doors. It's an invitation to think deeper. That isn't arrogance. That's intellectual honesty. What Cox managed to do in a two-hour conversation was shift the emotional tone from confrontation to curiosity. He reminded both Joe Rogan and the audience that science isn't here to demolish belief, but to set a framework, a foundation of observable facts, repeatable experiments, and testable theories. Within that foundation, people are still free to ask the deepest questions of existence. Why are we here? What does it mean to be conscious? Does the universe have a purpose? Is there a creator beyond the veil of what we can see? But Cox issues a gentle warning. If we're going to ask those questions, we must first accept what we've measured. You can't deny the distance between LA and New York, he explained. And you can't deny the 13.8 billion year history of the cosmos. 
These are not philosophical preferences. These are verified realities. But once those are accepted, the room for wonder actually grows, not shrinks. In the end, Cox didn't slam the door on religion or deliver a knockout blow to the idea of God. He didn't reduce the universe to cold equations. Instead, he opened a new kind of space, where science doesn't compete with belief, but helps it evolve. Where curiosity replaces dogma, where meaning doesn't have to come from being chosen, but from being conscious, from being aware, from being alive in a universe vast enough to hold both particles and poetry. So, no, the debate isn't over. But maybe that's the point. Maybe the goal was never to win, but to keep asking better questions. And in that, Brian Cox may have done something even more valuable than ending the debate. He elevated it. So, did Brian Cox truly end the debate between God and the universe? Maybe not with a final answer, but with something far more powerful, a reframing. He showed that science doesn't have to kill belief, but it does demand honesty. That the universe may not offer built-in meaning, but we do. And in a cosmos that's 13.8 billion years old, that makes our tiny spark of consciousness more extraordinary than ever. Whether you believe in God or not, Cox invites us all to trade certainty for curiosity. And that might be the most revolutionary idea of all.